Uh, Join me in standing if you would. We're opening our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 12, beginning our reading with verse 1. Romans 12, 1. Appreciate your prayers tonight. I would seek to cover what I feel like the Lord has directed me to for this service. Hold up the servant of the Lord, if you would, in prayer. Appreciate that. Romans chapter 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, or be being transformed, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Title of the message this evening, Conforming or Transforming, and What Makes the Difference? Conforming or Transforming, and What Makes the Difference? The difference. Heavenly Father, I appreciate, Lord, the sense of the sweet presence of Almighty God. You are here. You are here, Lord, and we welcome you. And we ask, O oh God, that tonight, through your word, Lord, through lips of clay, but Lord, so far beyond me and my understanding, that you would speak to us right where we are. We ask that Jesus Christ would be exalted. Oh, may he be lifted up in our midst. I ask that I, that we even would be minimized. And Lord, that your kingdom would be advanced. I pray over children and young people, adults and seniors, Lord. I'm asking, oh God, that you would meet us at our points of need and help us to get our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I'm asking, oh God, that even tonight, Lord, there would be definite steps of spiritual progress made internally and even externally, oh God, we pray. And Lord, we're asking, Lord, that all things would be done to the glory of God the Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The word conformed is sesquimatizo. I probably said it wrong. But it indicates the act of an individual assuming an outward expression that does not come from within him, nor is it representative of his inner heart life. Now, that's a mouthful. Let me try to illustrate. How many of you have gone to the closet? You push back your normal repertoire of clothing and you reach back to a section maybe that you haven't referenced for a year or two or three And you find that somehow, somehow there at the back of your closet, that that, that coat, that suit coat maybe that that, uh, has sat there for a while, it's a little dusty, but, but you say, oh, it's fall time, I haven't worn it for a while, and you go to put that on and you find that there at the back of the closet somehow, maybe it's humidity or 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 lack thereof, but 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 that coat has shrunk. And you go to put it on and It just doesn't fit. You may try and you try hard enough and it won't be long before that seam will tear. You're trying to conform the coat. It won't conform. Now you might be able in time to conform back to the coat, but you're not going to conform the coat. It's the idea of something trying to fit in or be squeezed into what it does not belong into. By the way, friends, that's the reason it doesn't go well living life without God. Because you were never meant to live without God. No wonder life gets tattered and messed up and broken and et cetera, et cetera, friends. Because we were not meant to do life without God. Think, not only does conforming speak of squeezing or trying to push something that doesn't fit, but, but it also, conforming also limits possibility. This water is limited 
this evening. It's squeezed, if you please, into the mold of this bottle. Now, I'm thankful for that, uh, especially this afternoon uh, when situations happen like they did. My wife had stopped at the grocery store to pick up a few items, and I went to open the back of the truck and uh, to remove and carry in things and not realizing that a jug of milk, that milk being conformed, squeezed into the mold of that jug, it, it made its way off the stuff there in the back of the truck and slid down and collided with the ground, and it wasn't pretty. If you see a white spot on the blacktop at the Wesley Center, you know what it is now. And that milk got free from the conformities of that jug. Now, friends, the reality is being conformed when it comes to our spiritual life it can seem tempting. We, through sinful nature and through the lust of the flesh, eyes, and the pride of life, we are drawn to things that we were not intended to partake of. That's what happened with Eve right from the beginning. She was drawn to something that God said no. God, God said, don't, don't, don't eat of it. And the devil twisted and he questioned God's motives. And it wasn't long before Eve saw that it was something that she was drawn to. And she became conformed to something that she was never intended to partake of. And Paul writing centuries later, he says, don't be conformed. Now, friends... It was a battle for Eve, it was a battle in Paul's day, and it's a battle for us this evening. This world, self and Satan, are seeking to squeeze us into a worldly mindset. Now understand, friends, when I say a worldly mindset, I'm talking about something far greater than some dress standards. Those matter, those have a part in this, but we're talking about a spirit and an attitude of life. Living with the me first mentality. Paul wrote to the believers there in Rome and he said, be not conformed. Sounds like some definite action needs to be taken. Now this evening service has a special focus upon the youth. So I'm going to be speaking to the youth. But this is not just for the youth. I do want to cover some areas of conformity that today's society, America in 2019, that's who I'm speaking to because that's who we are. There are some things here that we shouldn't have to cover, but we do because of where we're living and when we're living. I want to first reference the pressure of conformity in identity. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 tells us, that God in his plurality said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, et cetera, et cetera. The point is simply this. We, friends, are made in God's image. I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time here, but I will emphasize this. One of the arguments against evolution is that no other creature has this distinction. As much as you love your dog, as much as you want your dog to be in heaven, I'm convinced that there's not a dog in the world that has ever wondered if there is a heaven. Sister Plank, I'm sorry. Don't like to burst your bubble. The smartest chimpanzee, what scientists says is the closest to a human. I don't think the smartest chimpanzee has ever wondered is there a God? I don't think so. Why? We find out right here in Genesis 1.27, God says, I'm stamping man distinctly different than all my creation. Men, friends, not just men and women that are trained in a particular religion or faith, but men and women instinctively ask questions about eternity and God, etc. Why? Because we've been stamped, we've been marked with the image of God. Well, by the way, Jesus Interestingly enough, he addressed this issue. We sometimes miss this point. I heard it first from Robbie Zacharias, and it has marked me. 
Remember when the, the scholars of Jesus' day thought they could trip Jesus up and they asked him, is it right to pay taxes or not? And Jesus asked them to pull out a coin and they pulled out a coin and he, he said, whose inscription's on it? Uh, can we just say it this way? Whose image does it bear? That's what Jesus was asking. And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus profoundly silenced them when he said, render or give to Caesar that which is Caesar. Listen, he went on to say, render or give to God that which is God's. What bears God's image? We do. And Jesus, in, in essence, was saying, give taxes to Caesar, give yourself to God. Wow, hallelujah. Well, we were not only made in God's image, but Revelation 4 and other passages teach us that we were made for his glory. I, I, I love the saying from John Piper, while I disagree with his theology, I love this statement that he has made popular. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Friends, that's the truth. When we are living for God's glory, there comes into our life, as we sung about earlier, a deep satisfaction and purpose in life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. What were the design of God? Genesis 1 teaches that distinctly. And there is therefore in his design a distinction of gender. And all, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God made them male and female. He, he didn't apologize. He didn't say that I made Adam a little too male or I made Eve a little too female. When he made male to have responsibility, to be a leader, to be the aggressor in a healthy sense, to drive, to, 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 to need to accomplish in a task, more rational, etc. God did not apologize for that. He said, I made him male. Amen. I said some of the stuff I shouldn't need to cover, but, but I must. We live in America in 2019. When he made Eve uh, the help me, the, the, the perfect, well-fit companion to Adam, he didn't say, I, I made her to be too sensitive. Or, 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 or she, she's, she's uh, too, too talkative. Or, or, or too emotional, or, or I made her maybe too loving, too much of a care. No, God didn't apologize. He said, I made her female. Now, I understand I'm speaking in generalities. I know that every single dynamic doesn't fit up exactly with all the stereotypes. But listen, there are stereotypes for a reason. And it's not forced by society. It's part of the DNA of being male, and it's part of the DNA of being female. And God did not apologize for that. God knew what he was doing, amazingly enough. And friends, we tear down those distinctions to our own peril. I've been dealing this week in a long-distance situation. I've been dealing with the confusion of the genders, and it's a mess. And the more confused we get the more messed up things are. Friends, I'm not talking about harsh attitudes. There are people struggling with these things that we need to be willing to love with Jesus' love. But we are never called to minimize the truth, amen? We must speak the truth in love. It's exactly what Jesus did, friends. We're different, and we're supposed to be. We're different physically, emotionally, and psychologically. We are called to fill each other's lacks and gaps. I worked in a Christian school some years ago. We had a girl who came to the school. Her name was Kathy. Kathy had had a hard life. I don't know, she was probably 12 years of age, something like that, when she began to attend that Christian school she probably had suffered abuse. I don't know all her details, all her struggles. But Kathy had some problems. And one of Kathy's problems was she thought she was a cat sometimes. Now you might be looking at me funny, but I just wonder if sometimes she really did kind of think she was a cat. I mean, she'd snarl and she'd stick her fingers up like she was showing her claws. 
you're getting the picture that, that, that she had some problems. But I'm going to tell you what I never questioned. I questioned about some of her challenges. But I never questioned Brother Plank if she was really a cat. I never questioned that. My, my, my kids, maybe like your kids, they play that they are different characters and sometimes an animal. And little Macy, if Macy crawls around on the floor and roars like a lion, while I may react to it, I will tell you, it does not cross my mind wondering, maybe Macy has really turned into a lion. Now, friends, we get that. But through the conforming, through the pressure of this world, a society that is on the fast track at large from God, listen, we are facing confusion where people are actually wondering, am I a girl? Am I a boy? When they are very clearly the opposite. Amen. And friends, no matter how much Kathy thought she was a cat, Kathy wasn't a cat. Amen. No matter how much Macy's pretending to be a lion, we all know Macy's not a lion. There's the distinction of the genders. There is the desires of the genders. I illustrate this point I see in the youth service a year and a half ago, I'll demonstrate, I won't demonstrate it, but I'll, I'll just illustrate it again by, 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 uh, by word. My younger days, I liked to play some basketball. I wasn't anything great, but I liked to play. Broke my nose playing basketball, messed up my knee playing basketball. Maybe that tells you how good I was. We played street ball sometimes, but I will tell you this, even in street ball, there are some rules. Now, street ball is the kind of basketball where you don't call every ticky-tacky foul. <laughs> There's some contact. But I'm going to tell you what will not work even in street ball. I cannot run onto the court and see Jim with the basketball and decide that I don't want him to go to the other side and make a layup and just me run at Jim and tackle him and just pull him down. Even street ball won't allow that. Because what you understand in whatever particular sport or activity you like to partake in, there are some rules to the sport. If everybody doesn't agree on some rules, then listen, I'm headed somewhere, so stay with me. If everybody doesn't agree on the rules, you can't play the sport. Right? You can't just carry the ball around in basketball. You're going to have to dribble it. You can't just tackle people. You can try to steal the ball, but you can't tackle them. That's a different sport. <laughs> Stay with me. God, in both the distinction of the genders and the desires of the genders, God has placed some rules. Hear me. God has put some rules in place, hear me, so that we can play the game properly. Hallelujah. <laughs> they don't put rules in basketball so that you have a miserable time playing basketball. No, there are rules in basketball so you can play a successful game at basketball. God didn't put rules and limitations in regards to male and female so that he ruined our lives. No, he put limitations so that we can live out his intention successfully, happily. Amen. God knew what he was doing. Praise God. Let me tell you, I was on the airplane a lady named Sherry Wang, a year and a half ago or so, was flying out to California. Sherry had an incredible story. I don't know, she must, I'm going to guess she was maybe around 60 years of age. She had come from Taiwan. Her, her father, during the, the, the communist revolt or transition there, uh, uh, had, 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 had to escape China. He was, he was uh, a, a political leader. 
And he had to escape China. They went to Taiwan. And in time, she came to the States and got a degree, became successful in life. And now she's flying out to California to visit her daughter. And she's struggling. Her daughter, molested as a young girl, now identified in a same-sex relationship. And the story gets complicated. I won't go into all the details. But, but Sherry is just unfolding this to me. She's trying to love her daughter. But the situation is mixed up. And now her daughter wants to take it to another step. And Sherry is struggling. Sherry recognizes this isn't normal. This isn't right. Now listen, friends. I know. I know I'm not that far off even in our ranks to address these subjects. I know things the devil tried to do in my life to get me derailed and off track. And he hasn't stopped. If anything, it's intensified. But I'm here to tell you young people, I'm here to tell you adults, God's way is best. God knew what he was doing in both our distinctions and our desires. And we play outside God's rules to our own peril. We let confusion come in to, to, to ultimate confusion in our own life. God knows what he's about. And God's plan is still, Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Leave. I won't spend a lot of time here, but there is the call to create a new home with a new family identity. Amen. There is the call to cleave. God made them to be one flesh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Somebody wisely said, Mary doesn't, marriage doesn't make you one. It gives you merely the per permission to begin the process. And if you're married, you know a little bit about that. Leave, cleave. Now, I added one. Conceive. That's right, because God said, be fruitful and multiply. Amen, brother? Amen. <laughs> By the way, children have, a, I know everyone can have children, but children have a way of completing a home. It's God's design. I understand because of sin, the fall, because of physical limitations, friends, it's not always, it doesn't always happen. But listen, we ought to have God's attitude even towards children. God says children are a blessing. They're a heritage from the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's not be conformed to this world in the mindset of children as well. Wow. <laughs> I'm still talking about be not conformed. I've moved from identity now to internet. If you don't think the internet is one of the issues of our day, friend, you're not in tune. Maybe that's a good thing. But it's not a good thing if you're trying to raise a family for God or you're trying to influence the coming generations, friends. We're going to have to recognize that the Internet's an issue. And it's far more than about whether you allow it or whether you don't allow it. Amen. 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 Uh, now, now listen, every man has to be fully persuaded in his own mind, but we got to get past just that issue, whether to have it or not. We've got to face the reality that it is marching on. It's advancing. And it's not evil or good in and of itself. Amen. I remember the advancement of technology in my own life. And I've touched on this. I won't spend much time here. But I've always been kind of a techie guy. I, 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 I liked having a Palm Pilot. Some of you remember those. I can remember when the cool thing was to have a small flip phone. Some of you remember that just a few years back as well. I've said this and thought this. I don't think when Jamie and I got married in 2004, I don't think Google was a verb. Think about that. I don't think Google was a verb in 2004. And as it began to advance and, and uh, uh, exponentially increase, 
I remember at the age of 23 having an apartment by myself and it was becoming a common thing to have the internet and get the internet. And, and I remember I, I was looking into it. I got a computer and I was looking into getting the internet. And I think we had come through revival time. And, and I just remember as I was contemplating that, thinking about that, I remember the Spirit of God checking me. And just, just hear my story here. I was a young man by myself, no accountability in an apartment, and I felt the Holy Spirit check me and say, David, you don't need that. Now, friends, I didn't say God was anti-internet. Amen. Stay with me, friends. Because sometimes I think we have approached these technology issues as either just black and white or we've just acted like there needs to be no instruction. And I think we get off track both ways. I knew or I sensed that God was giving me a check about that. But listen, friends, now it's everywhere. Maybe some of you tonight have splurged. You got a new refrigerator, and that new refrigerator has a camera. In it, maybe multiple cameras. And you get to Weiss, if I said it right, or some local grocery store of your particular choice, and you wonder, oh my, do we have any milk? And now, friends, you pull out your phone, you open the app, you turn the camera on in your refrigerator, and you can figure out if you have milk or not. Now, you might look at that a little funny and think that's a bit far out. It's not far out, it's here. And it's just around the corner before it'll be common. Yes. Just had someone tell me this week they can start their car with their phone, the app on their phone. It's called the Internet of Everything. It's here, friends. And there is only so much one can do to avoid it. It was a lot easier when it was just a question, am I going to have it in my little apartment or not, friends? Now it's everywhere. It's virtually unavoidable. And how are we going to deal with it? Because I will tell you, the spirit of this age, that, that connectivity, and, and, and we'll get there. It, it is squeezing us, friends. It, it is conforming us if we allow it to. Amen. I'm, I'm talking to the saints of God, too, here tonight. I'm talking to me, too, tonight. Now you pray for me. This availability has unfortunately led to addiction. Now, before you just peg one type of addiction, let me take a curve, a detour. One of the forms of addiction is screen addiction. Do not raise your hand, but how many of you, how many of us have checked our phone during this service? I said, don't raise your hand. I don't know, Brother Chubb, I don't know how you all used to do it, but somehow you used to make it through an entire service without responding to a text message. I don't know how we did it. Somehow the world kept turning without my being available during service. I don't know how it happened. It couldn't today. Well, at least we think it couldn't. You know, I've got to have it on. I mean, who knows what kind of emergency might happen. Now, I understand there are exceptions, friends. Listen. Okay, it's not about legalism. This isn't about one size fits all. But there is a point here, friends, that this world is wanting to squeeze us into a mold in regards to this technology issue. And friends, some of the addiction is just screen addiction. We become so attached. You know, we're going to go to the restaurant and have good family time. We're going to have fellowship with our brother and sister. We're going to use our Bible 
our, app, our Bible app for, for the scripture. Then comes the notification. So-and-so posted about what they had for dinner. <laughs> there it comes at the top. I can't miss the hat. And that's important stuff. I'm not far off, friends. And we get distracted. We get disengaged. I'm not talking about pornography here, friends. I'm just talking about being too attached. Listen, I know about some of this because God's talked to me about some of this. Sometimes he's used my wife to talk to me about some of this. By the way, did you know that God oftentimes uses people to speak to us? I'll let the Lord talk to me. Maybe he just did. Amen. I'll tell you, I'm not anti-technology. I think we miss the boat when we just make it anti-technology. But friends, listen to this. I am also healthily wary of technology. And understand that with all its benefits, it does, pre- it does also present incredible challenges. And we accept the benefits and ignore the challenges to our spiritual peril, friends. Oh, my. (laughs) David, don't kill the service. There's social addiction. I will tell you. (laughs) I am not anti-video game. Well, not too much. But I will tell you, when I hear about preacher boys, and I've heard this, when I hear about preacher boys, maybe senior year of Bible college, spending an evening getting together, and their evening is just video games. I tell you, friends, I'm concerned. When I see young men, hours, hopefully it's, it's a non-issue about the bad video games. That, that, that should just be automatic. Listen, friends. I'm not sure God is thrilled about us spending hours killing people. I'm just practicing war. Well, maybe. Maybe. Pray for me. Pray for me. I don't think I'm far off here. I've never heard a successful man of God say, the key to my success is I reach level 176 in need for speed, or whatever it is. I've never heard him say that. Now listen, I have Facebook. I try to use it for good purposes, godly purposes, connection purposes. But listen, I've never heard a godly woman say, the key to my success as a godly woman is that I saw so-and-so's new outfit, outfit on Facebook. I was the first to see it. I, I, I know, I know about their family vacation. Now listen, friends, these things... I hope you don't hear that I'm anti all these things because I've been trying to speak in a way that I believe is spiritually balanced. But listen, friends. We get saturated into these things to our own peril. There is a holy balance. I'm convinced that the Holy Ghost still talks to us if we're seeking to please him. And he will check us and he will put guidelines and he'll say, you just need to turn that off and you just need to shut that off and maybe you just need to start coming to f- into service, turning your phone off and just seeing if the world will still go forward. And if you need to use the Bible on your phone, your device, maybe you just need to put it into airplane mode so no notifications will come up. Amen. 
I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying maybe. <laughs> Listen, I, I understand, friends. We're in an age where we've got to communicate. We've got to. I do. I stay too communicative. Too, too communicative. Just ask my wife. But listen, friends, we cannot just be squeezed into conform to the mold of this world. We can't do it just because everybody else is doing it. Amen? We got to have spiritual intentionality with this. Moving on. I shouldn't have to talk much about the sexual addiction aspect. But friends, it is, it has invaded about every level of society. The average age, the last statistic I have here of a young man viewing pornography has dropped to 10 years of age. 10. And 75% of it takes place on a smartphone. Now listen. Parents, let's wake up. Amen. Amen. I am so thankful my father didn't have to make a choice about whether I had a smartphone at 14 years of age. I thank God I did not. Friends, amen. I will not apologize for that. I'm not trying to put everybody in one box. I'm just telling you, I know the battles I had. I know the things I was tempted with and struggling with in those ages. And I'm sure thankful that I didn't have it sitting in my pocket when I didn't have the strength or maturity or wisdom to handle it. We somehow get it that we wait on our children till, till they're 16 to drive a car. We get that. We accept that. And then something far more dangerous than a car. Far more dangerous than a car. We somehow think they can handle it. Friends, we're kidding ourselves. Listen, I'm not here just to be harsh, friends. I'm here to sound a warning. We can't walk down this road of peril and difficulty without coming alongside and having some spiritual wisdom and discernment. Amen. When I have godly men coming to me and talking about their struggles, we are ignorant to think young men are not having their struggles. Amen. Oh, <laughs> oh, our activity, moving on. Our activity on technology must be sanctified. Therefore, there are websites that I avoid. There are apps, even news apps, even a conservative news app that I have deleted. Yeah, they were just putting pictures on there on a consistent basis that I didn't need to be tempted with. So I just felt like I ought to delete the app. Accountability. Accountability. There needs to be a recognition that I need other people to help me in this journey. And for me, the number one accountability partner is my wife. Amen. Others as well ought to be in our lives as understood accountability partners. But listen, friends, sometimes it's going to take abstinence. Now, I'm still talking about technology. I believe God would help us to not be so conformed to the image of this world, to the, to, to the priorities of this world. It's just sometimes we intentionally disengaged. Amen. Now listen, I'm, speak, I'm preaching to myself too here tonight. What about prayer time? What about prayer time? I've already touched on, what about Church. Did you just sacrifice for the Lord and just say, I'm going to set that aside? Now, I understand. If you have an emergency or you have to communicate that way, there's something very legitimate. Friends, again, this is not just a straight jacket. This isn't just legalism, friends. I'm just talking about our getting to a point where we, we distinctly detach ourselves. Well, what about family time? That, that's an area the Lord's tried to help me with. And then the danger times. I remember a young man coming confessing to me at a youth convention that nighttime was his struggle 
he needed to just detach from this. Friends, all of this is in the context of do not be conformed to this world. If I've preached it too hard, pray for me. If you think I've preached it too easy, well, pray for me. (laughs) But listen, friends, one thing we dare not do is act like we can be squeezed into the pressures of today's world and still please God. We cannot, friends, and it might take radical action. Jesus said, if your hand offend you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Now, I'm moving quickly in this next one, but interaction. Young people, God is calling you to proper interaction with yourself. Suicide, proper self-respect, recognizing that you are formed by God and he has thoughts towards you that are good. So don't brag about yourself and don't belittle yourself. Amen. Both are unhealthy spiritual extremes. Do something with yourself. Amen. Learn how to work hard. Seek after what God's plan and will is for your life. You'll find fulfillment in it. Seek proper attitude or interaction with your family. Be kind to your brother or sister. Amen. No matter how much of a pain they are. Obey and honor your parents. Interact properly with your friends. Choose them well. Because frankly, most of the time, the friends that we choose will oftentimes directly affect who we become. Don't just look for friends. Be a friend. This is really spiritual. And then proper action with special friends. (laughs) Friends of the opposite sex. Make the purity of others a priority. Amen? Guys, learn that girls struggle more with their emotions. We struggle oftentimes more with our drives. Don't flirt with her. Draw her in if you're not ready for a godly, committed relationship. You'll probably end up hurting both of you. Amen? Help protect her heart. Girls, you have no idea how much guys struggle with their eyes. Do everything you can to dress, act, and talk in an attractive but modest way. Amen. Help protect their eyes. Wow. Now we're going to shift gears. Do not be conformed, squeezed into the mold of this world. We've touched on a few things that I know are pressuring us in the United States in 2019. But how do you go from conforming to transforming? I'm glad you asked. I hope you have your Bible still open to Romans chapter 12. Paul is speaking And he says to them, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The word present here in the Greek is in the aorist tense and signifies an action taken once and for all. In other words, it's God, here I am. From now on. Forward, that's the message of entire sanctification or heart holiness. God, here I am, I'm yours from here forward. It's a distinct moment in time. It's so beautifully typified in the marriage vow. July 31st, 2004, I made a commitment to this beautiful tall lady over here. She made a commitment to me and we said, from here forward, we belong to each other. For better, for worse. We have an older man in our church, 78 years old, John Wayne Smith. He loves to tease. Now, he loves his wife with all his heart, but he likes to say this. (laughs) He's like, they've been married for, what, 60 years, something like that. He says, I've stayed around for the worse. Now I'm going to stick around for for the better. Now, he's just teasing. There was a distinct point. Now listen, we're not getting married. 
And sometimes, friends, the devil wants to trick us into a life where we are, we're, we're getting surrendered. Lord, help us here. God wants to get us to a place where we are surrendered. It's not I'm getting married, I, I'm married. Now, if you're getting married as in you're moving towards a particular date, wonderful. Uh, I'm talking about once you've moved past that date. I don't tell people my wife and I are getting married. We are married. We made that commitment. It was a distinct time, action. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. But listen, in that presenting, and by the way, God gets pretty specific into what all my offering myself as a living sacrifice would be. It will require a sacrifice. In other words, I have to die. I have to die. Friends, don't look at me funny because that's what Paul said. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. When, 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 when they in that society heard sacrifice, they did not think, I'm going to give a little extra in the offering. When they heard living sacrifice in that sacrificial system, they knew in a sacrifice something was offered up. That lamb no longer had rights on its life. That was the context of living sacrifice. Now, it wasn't living, it was sacrifice. But in our lives, friends, God is calling us to make a presentation that from this point forward, I don't mean there won't be battles, I don't mean there won't be times we have to go back and put something back on the altar, but I'm telling you, friends, God is calling us to a point where we say, I am surrendered, not just I'm surrendering. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. But what's interesting, and I just have to boil this to a close, what's interesting is that it says... If you will present, it says that you will be being transformed. That's beautiful. That also is so beautifully typified in the marriage relationship. There was a distinct moment in time on that Saturday afternoon when, when Jamie and I became married. From that point on, we were married. But listen. Listen. We'll confess to you that there has been ongoing transforming in the development of that relationship. There's been some painful times. There's been some wonderful times. Why? Because we presented. Because we committed. Amen? And God's saying... I want to move you from being squeezed into the mold of this world. But it's going to be pivoted on the point of you and me presenting, surrendering, fully committing. And at that pivot point, when God says your, your sacrifice is acceptable. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes, friends, sometimes we say I'm all surrendered, but God hasn't said we're all surrendered. I've done everything I know to do, but God hasn't yet said we've done everything we know to do. See, it says acceptable from him, well-pleasing to him. We make progress forward when God says, you're all's on the altar. Listen, from that, friends, God wants to develop us in a life in the spirit. Hear this. Where we have not arrived. We don't have it all figured out, friends. But from this point forward, we're all in. Amen. And God begins to work in us and mold us and conform us to his image, not to the mold of this world, friends. There is a be being transformed. Is, entire, is, is the life of holiness a crisis or a process? Yes! Is marriage a crisis or a process? Yes. There's a distinct moment where we made a commitment. And there is a life of learning to live that out in a proper way. Listen, friends. Brother McDowell, you're coming, if you would. 
I want you to stand with me. And we are in an age where there is the pressure to conform. But God says, I have something better. (laughs) In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. I'm using this, you can't see it maybe, but I'm using this little corn kernel to illustrate that. Imagine that that particular corn kernel, he's got ideas for his life. You know, he's going to be popcorn. (laughs) But he hears the call. He hears the call of the great farmer, Jesus. Jesus says, little colonel, unless you go into the ground, unless you present yourself, as far as you're concerned, dead, you're going to abide alone. But, but, if you will trust the design of the great farmer, one kernel, friend, can turn into hundreds of kernels. Hear this. Jesus said, you lose your life, you're going to find it. By the way, Jesus didn't call us to do anything he didn't do. Jesus was buried Jesus died, and because he died, we have life. And he's calling you and me to die, and through our death, we're going to find his life. And we're going to be life to others. Hallelujah. I don't know how to present it any more simply. See, friends, we're going to have to be willing to present. And on the other side, friends, of that commitment, that crisis, there is a beautiful life that God wants to unfold of me being transformed. Take my life, the songwriter said. I close with this before they sing. Coons are here. Remember reading in Eric and Hannah's book, Focused, I recommend it. Of the points in their lives when they they presented, they came to the crisis moment. No clue what all was to unfold with their lives. Listen. But in the moment they said, All right, God, I'll give you full sway. Now, friends, you know, you know about them. You know how God's using them. Listen. But it all unfolded from the pivot point of presenting. Young people, adults, God is calling us to offer. The choice is ours. The victory is his. Let's go on. My life and let it be consecrated, Lord. He is drawing your heart tonight. Just respond to what he Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them And let them move at the impulse of Is that your my prayer this love. Praise God. Take my feet Praise God. and let them be Praise swift God. and beautiful Praise for God. Thee. Swift and beautiful.
faithful to us and calling us to yourself O Lamb of God we come pray that tonight as we seek your face Lord as we encourage others and press forward ourselves I ask O God that you would lead us onward take us forward Lord and may we live out, Lord, what Paul was writing to the Roman church. May we live out a life of not conforming, but rather being transformed. And that the mind of Christ might dwell in us, pivoted upon, founded upon a full and total surrender. Thank you, Lord, for what you're speaking. So we gather in, Lord, give us ground. We'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, I'm encouraging you, if you're able, to come forward. Create an atmosphere of prayer. Maybe you need to come and pray. Maybe you didn't have courage or weren't sure. Maybe now the Holy Spirit is drawing your heart and just giving you opportunity, friends, to gather in. And let's make this prayer time count for eternity. Hallelujah. 